Dr. Coleman, you emphasize the uh, nature of research at the university and how that plays into economic development. I'd like to ask you a couple questions about that, both ends of the continuum. One is um, grants for research, uh, the, the public impression is that they've moved more toward corporate grants than government support, et cetera. Is that true? And when that's true, what does the university do to make sure those kinds of relationships are disclosed and benefit the public, not just the corporation? And then on the back end, when somebody creates a company, what does the university do to make sure that the IP or the intellectual property that goes into that company is used uh, or can be used to raise money and build a really entrepreneurial company and not just tie up university assets or relate to it? Sure, sure. Uh, both issues are important. Uh, at least in our university, federal support for research is far, far outweighs any industry business partnerships. I think we've been trying to, in fact, increase our industry university partnerships from about 5%. If we could get up to 10%, it would be terrific. But it's still a very, very low uh, percentage of our total research. However, I do think it's an area that we need to pay a lot of attention to because now many companies are not investing in basic research anymore. They are, in fact, uh, counting on research universities to help them do this. So it's really an important uh, engagement. You know, we have all, all sorts of carefully considered rules about the rights of faculty to publish and students to publish. We will not put our faculty in danger or students in danger with the notion that we're going to do something proprietary that can't be published. So we try very hard to make sure that those relationships are open and transparent. Um, at the same time, uh, we have tried very hard uh, to uh, let our faculty be more entrepreneurial and to understand how to do track transfer, whether it's a licensing agreement or a new business starting. And again, I think we have pretty well considered rules about uh, how we're going to go about looking for licensing partners. We do seek patent protection when we can because we know that many technologies will not be developed unless there's patent protection for the company that's going to develop it. Uh, we do, we will take stock in uh, new companies to start up. We have that as a as an option within the university. Uh, but the other thing that we do with our royalties that come back, and I don't know whether this was implicit in your question, but that we try to plow as much as we can of the, that particular revenue stream back into gap funding for research that needs some proof of concept before it can be licensed. So we try to use the resources from that particular source to help stimulate more activity of the same kind. You mentioned about the you mentioned about the um, research and development corridor that you par partnership with with the area universities. Um, what's um, what's your relationship as it relates to the state legislatures in Michigan far as um, passing public policy or just designing different legislation to support your research and development um, corridor? Sure. You know what we decided we actually did this. Uh started a little bit over two years ago to have these discussions among the presidents, my fellow presidents at Michigan State and Wayne State University, because we felt like rather than each of us independently trying to do things to attract companies with the economic development, that we wanted to do something visible at the top to give the signal that we were cooperating, to make sure that all of our economic development efforts were coordinated, to make sure that our faculty understood that we wanted, in fact, expected uh, collaborative relationships at the faculty level. So we did this not with a legislative urging, but on our own, because we thought it was important. And uh, it's interesting to me in the last two years, when we first did it, there seemed to be a lot of suspicion. Why are you doing this? Are you trying to cut out the other universities in the state? And, and so we've tried very hard to let people understand that this isn't about diminishing the rest of higher education in the state. It's about taking an asset and leveraging the asset to give a branding to the state that people outside will notice as well as people inside. And so now, after two years, I'm getting many, many fewer questions or suspicion about the URC. I think people are beginning to see the value. We haven't gotten any additional state funding because of it. Uh, we, I would love that, but I would love more funding for all of higher education. The other thing we've done in the state, because I think it's really, really important, the University of Michigan spearheaded an effort that's really a Michigan uh, entrepreneurial initiative that we're selling, trying to sell to Michigan foundations to put money in a pot that all the 15 public institutions in the state can compete for to enhance entrepreneurial education among students 
and uh, entrepreneurial activities of the faculty. We've raised $3.5 million for this program, and every single university in Michigan has been able to participate. Uh, the least money has come to the University of Michigan. So that we're trying to partner where we can with everybody, but take an asset and really enhance it in an area that we know will work. Dr. Coleman, uh, first of all, go blue. Hey, yeah, love it. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, Michigan, uh, the state of Michigan passed what was called the uh, Michigan Civil Rights Initiative in uh, what many people believe was a misguided effort to stop racial preferences and diversity in university admissions. Uh, but from what I've read, the University of Michigan has actually increased African American enrollment, which is great. So my question is, uh, first, how has the university accomplished this in spite of the initiative? And second, have you set up a model program for other universities to follow? Sure, let me go back a little bit to give a little uh, history to your question. Uh, as many of you know in this room, the University of Michigan fought very valiantly all the way to the Supreme Court to preserve affirmative action as a tool that universities and colleges could use to diversify their student bodies. And in fact, we won that battle at the Supreme Court. So it was very disappointing to me that the voters of Michigan decided to pass a constitutional amendment to prohibit the use of affirmative action in Michigan colleges and universities. One of the things that we did right after the election uh, is that we formed a group on campus called Diversity Blueprints. And we got them working right away the day after, 24 hours after the election they were at work. They gave us all sorts of good ideas about things that we could do to counter this, this, this new prohibition that we had. I thought it was extremely important for the message to get out to our families in our state that just because this has passed, we are going to work really, really hard because we believe in the educational value of diversity for all students. It isn't about one race or anything else. Um, it isn't even about righting past wrongs. It's about what provides the best educational environment for all students. So we revved up very quickly. I was out all over the state. Uh, we set up teams once, uh, once to make sure that students understood the opportunity. And the thing that we wanted to avoid is what happened in California and Washington State after similar uh, uh, amendments passed in their states. They had a, a just drastic decline in applications from minority students. 70% decline, and if students don't apply, you have no hope of recruiting them. So our goal was to keep the applications up, to really make good linkages. We already have a lot of programs that we interact with K through 12 schools to try to help strengthen the backgrounds of students so that they can be competitive when they apply to Michigan. So we've worked really, really hard. And I, you know, while we have slightly increased our numbers of African American students on campus, we have not been equally successful in all minority groups. So we're holding our own with very small declines, and so I'm pleased that we, were, we didn't experience dramatic drops, but it is work we have to do year in and year out. And I think it makes our campus just, an, uh, just a vibrant, wonderful place. Going back to the election, mm -hmm. it's my understanding from the president of Oberlin that he has been working hard along with other presidents mm -hmm. to get students to have students have the opportunity to vote mm -hmm. on campus. Mm -hmm. Where does that stand? Because I do think that's probably a part of the issue. Sure. Uh, let's see, uh, Marvin Krislov is one of ours. He was my general counsel before he left me to go to Oberlin. And it's, it's, it's really terrific. Um, you know, certainly we set up uh, many, many opportunities for students to register and uh, were very, very active. And so I think the issue is whether or not they can vote in the uh, university community or where their home community is. And I think that that is an issue that needs continual work because I don't think it's appropriate to limit people's participation in the political process and particularly not students because they simply happen to be at school and they couldn't go home to vote. So I am very much in favor of that kind of an approach. And in a school like Oberlin, it's really important because most of their students are from other states and it's not realistic for them to go home. 